All right, coming at you live from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. Another special edition of Sound Waves. And today, I'm blessed enough to have Professor Rob Larson, How you who did. just wrote the book Bit Tyrants, and also wrote a book that I've been talking about a lot on this show is Capitalism Versus Freedom, which I was telling Mr. Larson before I started recording was stolen out of my car with my clothes yesterday. Living here in West Oakland is no joke. And they got my book where I had all my highlighted questions. So <laughs> it happens. But Professor Larson, thank you for taking some time to talk to us today. Thank you, man. My pleasure. I'm sorry about your loss, bro. <laughs> I was like, I've been so tweeting this book out. And I think that's how I even got a hold of you was, was through Twitter, tweeting out uh, hmm. like something about the book. I can't remember what it was exactly. But um, yeah, I, I really fell in love with it because I, I feel like I was reading it right around the time people were protesting um opening up the government uh, like they were uh they were at the uh city halls with their guns and everything crying for the applebees to get open <laughs> lieutenant governors saying they're going to sacrifice themselves for olive garden um <laughs> and it really brought in it brought that perspective of freedom and what really is freedom um I also work, I don't know if I told you this, um, I work at one of the emergency shelters we have here in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. or in, the, in California in general, um, for the unhoused, the homeless population. It's a hotel. Um, we have about 340 or so uh, homeless people in there, and that's kind of a, a constant uh, theme I have with them when we're, when we're having our deep discussions of what is freedom. Um, and your book, Capitalism Versus Freedom, really shined a light on that question. Um, That's great, man. Yesterday I had on Professor... Oh, man. Uh, I had on Professor Ken Hammond yesterday, uh, who uh, teaches uh, history, Asian studies, I believe, at a New Mexico state. And he did kind of a debunking about China. And we talked a lot about, you know, the freedom of the press. <laughs> you know how... People always want to talk about how authoritarian China is, um, but our yeah. press is controlled by just a handful of people, and it's not very free. Mm. Indeed. Um, now, your new book, Bit Tyrants, shines a light on the tech industry, which is an industry that I have worked in, I can't lie. Um, living here in the Bay Area, it's it's literally impossible to not have some affiliation with that industry. It's just so large. Um, <laughs> and the, right off the bat in the introduction of your book, uh, holding a magnifying glass up to the monumental tech corporations is the purpose of this book, and it won't conform to the conventional picture of big tech as friendly giants with free software a picture that's finally wearing thin anyway. I wash my brains of it. Uh, first of all, I love the way you write. It's, it's hard hey, to put thanks, one of man. your books down. Thanks. It gets, uh, it gets mixed um, reviews, but I feel very good about it. <laughs> uh, you talk a lot about market or network effects. 
Mm. Am I saying that right? Oh, yeah. Hello? Oh, did we lose you? Yeah, you're saying it right, man. Okay, okay, I didn't hear you for a second. (laughs) Uh, Network effects. Can you give us a a quick explanation of what those are in in regards to uh, big tech? Yeah, for sure, man. So if you've had uh, some other professors and academics in here, you've probably uh, learned by now that when you uh, take econ, uh, you get a really nice kind of simple picture where markets, you know, uh, you know, the places you go to buy and sell things, right? That's a market. So a farmer's market mm-hmm. or the mall or a downtown street or the Amazon marketplace, all of those are markets, just places people go to do commerce, you know? Well, markets, you know, the mm-hmm. way we teach it, it's, you know, there's supply and demand and they reach a balance and everyone's happy. It's a very, very simple, uh, very appealing picture. And I mean, you know, that's fine. But what you discover if you start to look into the data, like the different businesses, that operate in all these different markets, what you see is like they're not particularly identical. Like just think of all the different goods and services that we produce. You know, you've got uh, you know back rubs and car components and smartphone cases and you know a mid-size carrier aircraft. Like they're so diverse. There's so much variety of goods and services and markets. Mm-hmm. If the products are so different, why would the markets be the same? You know, so I often tell my mm-hmm. students when I'm teaching them the very basic supply and demand model that I got to teach them to, you know, do an econ basic class. I always tell them like this is the most mm-hmm. stripped down, simplified picture possible. The reality is markets evolve in all kinds of directions depending on what product or service that we're making and how people consume it. You know, so there's a ton of variety there. But uh, one thing we see in these kind of markets when we talk about the tech sector, you know, the high tech economy. Uh, what we see there is that very typically the products or services come to us through networks where the value of the service is in some way or another based on connecting us to other people or other people's like creations or resources, you know, and that's not true for other markets, right? If you buy a pair of Reeboks and then I buy a pair of Reeboks, that doesn't make your pair like more valuable or something. They're just unrelated purchases, right? On the other hand, that's not true Mm -hmm. for products that are mediated through networks. So if you, you know, uh, whatever, however old people have to be before their parents let them get a Facebook page, for example, say some kid, you know, turns Mm -hmm. 12 or whatever, and uh, they get a Facebook account. Okay, well, when they get that, you know, believe it or not, it makes your Facebook account slightly more useful because now there's one more party with whom you might connect or who might like your posts or share them with their peer group, you know, it's the weird nature of things like phones, social media networking, like Facebook or Instagram, as more people use them, they gain more value to you. You know, as more people get phones, it's more parties that you can connect with and get information from, you know, it's just the feature of these markets that are network based. Well, what can we say about these network based markets? Well, there is something that we call the network effect, or sometimes the network externality. And it refers to just that, right? The value of the product increasing as more people use it. Well, the ramifications of that network effect are that you have a strong tendency towards like monopolization and centralizing of market share and control over that industry in a relatively small number of firms, commonly one single company, and other times just like one or two or three giant companies. And when you have one huge firm that dominates a market, we call that monopoly, of course. And we have a history of that in capitalism. Lots of markets are prone to monopoly, not just network-based ones. It's like Rockefeller had an oil monopoly for decades in America. I mean, think about how powerful that is and how much money came from that. So you can have these things in the old economy too. But network effects in the tech sector, the new economy, as we say, they mean we're more prone than ever to having monopoly or maybe just two giant firms. And when you have a couple giant firms that run the industry, we call that oligopoly. So a monopoly would be... Uh, you know, any industry where you've got a single firm. So like Microsoft for about 25, 30 years had a complete monopoly on computing operating systems. If you wanted to use a computer, you're using Windows. You have a small number of people using Apple and its operating system, you know, with Mac computers. But uh, that was definitely mm-hmm. a small niche that Microsoft had more than 90% of the market. That's pretty much monopoly territory. An oligopoly would be something like uh, Google and Apple 
which make the operating systems for our smartphones, right? If you have an Android phone, mm -hmm. that's a Google-based operating system. And of course, the iPhone uses Apple's operating system. Just two companies there. These are network effect-based effect monopolies. You know, people used Microsoft computers because they had a big corporate user base. So if I'm making a computer program, like a game or a workplace software, like Spreadsheet, uh, software or any other kind of application, I'm going to make it to run on Windows because that's where all the users are. And as more developers make games and apps for Windows, that attracts more users because that's where all of the useful software is, is on that Windows platform. And so you get this positive feedback process. That's the network effect leading to monopoly. And it's true today with Google and Apple. You know, if you want to make an app, a lot of people, certainly in your neck of the woods, and mine too. You know, I live near Seattle. I live in Tacoma, which is sort of Seattle's Oakland. You know, uh, out here, so many people are trying to make it. By having a <laughs> That's uh, yes, there they you are. Go. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities, but a lot of people out here and where you live are trying to make a living with a breakthrough app, you know, that they're going to sell to, you know, that they're going to get people to buy or buy, you know, in-app purchases through, but you have to get approval to sell that thing from uh, the, the various Android app stores, including the app stores by the actual handset makers like Samsung and of course Apple's you know, app store. And they curate that very, you know, they're very open that they have a list of criteria about which, which apps they'll take, which ones they won't. And they have a ton of criteria and some of them are vague and they even say, we reject some apps for reasons we don't say here. So it's a market that they just completely control, you know? Well, that's the power that comes from a monopoly or an oligopoly in an industry. And with the network effect that we see in tech, that's what we, that's why we're stuck with all these monopolies. You know, YouTube's another great example of a online monopoly, you know, I mean, and I love Vimeo. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people I know work in video and they <laughs> use that, you know, but it's kind of more for professionals. You know, most people, if you've got a video, you want the world to see, you're going to put it on YouTube. And because there's so much video, YouTube. that attracts all the users. And that user base attracts all the producers. And you get that same sort of positive feedback, self-reinforcing uh, system. And that's why today YouTube, YouTube users upload 65 years of video a day. That's network effects. Jesus. Like that's a monopolistic platform there. But there's clear economics behind it. You know, this is why AT&T had a landline monopoly for the 20th century it's different tech but the economic patterns the same it's weird it's like in physics you see the same patterns on very different scales very different eras but that basic value patterns there so the markets still evolve in the same way crazy huh no it is crazy because there's still gate you know this this podcast started as a music show uh, bitter lake is a band and we always talk about there's still gatekeepers. The internet is not, sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, there's still gatekeepers when it comes to like breaking through. So like you said, we said 65,000 hours. How many hours again? It's it's 65 okay. years of video. I don't even know how many years. hours that is. Yeah, well, think about Jesus. it. Jesus. You, you got billions of users. Everyone's uploading their phone up to their face saying, everyone's been waiting for my take on the Avengers movie. I mean, most of it's garbage, you know, <laughs> because anyone can do it. <laughs> like the volume of it, it's like a surging river. How much, I mean, you know, we're all YouTube users, I'm sure. Like the amount of content mm -hmm. that's there is just completely friggin' bonkers, man. But it just reflects these same ramifications. And also, uh, you had a great take on, I want to say it was in Capitalism vs. Freedom, about cell phones and the internet and where they come from. Because we have oh, this sure. myth that, uh, you know, Steve Jobs is this amazing innovator. And Bill Gates, these guys are all these genius innovators. Jeff Bezos, genius innovator. Yes. Uh, and you really broke down uh, the technology in just the cell phone alone to show that uh, all these technologies did not come from these people that we think are the genius innovators. Can you please elaborate on that? Because I think that debunking is so important. 
For sure, man. Absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I definitely do touch on it in Capitalism versus Freedom, but uh, in Bit Tyrants, I have a whole chapter on this, and I've written about it for current affairs and other places too, if folks want to explore that casually. So you're, what you said is exactly right. If you look at these billionaires of today, especially the guys that come out of tech, you know, Gates, Zuckerberg, uh, Brin and Page over at Google, Bezos. Uh, it's true. Like everyone says, well, you know, these guys, yes, they're billionaires and yes, they have all the money and yes, they control our lives, but that's okay because they created the technology. You know, they developed these incredibly mm -hmm. useful hardware and software platforms and we use them all the time and we totally take them for granted and rely on them for everything, which is very true. <laughs> and they'll say, but so they invented that tech. They deserve to be an all powerful ruling class that decides what should happen in the world and have suspicious flight records with Jeffrey Epstein and all that. <laughs> you know, it's one of the great perks of our society, apparently. This is where all the billionaires and elite people go. So I mean, there must be something there. But I have to say, uh, if you look at the record, like there's a record on this, like where technology comes from, like the internet and all the mobile technology that makes your phone work, you know, uh, all mm -hmm. this stuff, like it was developed, you know, in the last couple of decades. So there's long records of how it was developed. And the record is the opposite of what all these people say. Like the huge, huge majority of the fancy technology that lets us go online and have online platforms and make our phones work, it's developed in the public sector. It's developed by publicly funded government entities. And if you look at the record, mainly it's the military and the university system and their research arms. That tends to be where most of this research took place. And indeed, to this day, that's true with our emerging biotechnology, which you know, I figure in 10 years, I'll write bio tyrants and write a book about our crazy uh, biotech <laughs> companies because gene editing is becoming something we're able to do on living people, which is a crazy, you know, sci-fi thing. But so taking a look at this research, though, like the Internet is the place to start. Well, a lot of people know this much. The Internet, you know, originally was developed by the Pentagon and the American kind of tech research oriented university campuses, especially MIT, Stanford, U Utah and a couple of others. And it, the Internet's original name was DARPAnet because it was the network that was administered by DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. It's the Pentagon's research arm. And they get a lot of money from the military to find new ways to blow up brown people in the third world, you know. But it often ends up with these major, mm -hmm. major uh, uh, innovations, you know. And a lot of computing and early radio and everything comes from that government support and military support as well. But the internet, it was developed by the Pentagon to have a nuclear conflict survivable network and also to coordinate, you know, Cold War era espionage patterns. And also because university scientists wanted an easier way to share data sets, you know, looking at each other's data is a big part of being a scientist and having to ship box loads of documents around so that you can look at my results. You know, it's a pain in the ass. So all these reasons they tried to develop this decentralized information system, a network of networks or an internet work, as they eventually called it. But it was all through that DARPA funding. And then eventually DARPA carved off its own network. And then the National Science Foundation took over, which is our other publicly funded, funded uh, basic R&D operating scientific research body, you know, and it makes sense. Anyone who knows anything about research or science will sort of be able to see, I think, why it's usually these public sector entities that do this research. Because after all, I mean, doing research in science, you never know if you're going to discover something useful. You know, you don't know what's in front of you. It's undiscovered, you know. It's not like in a video game where it's you know, two levels until you discover the steam engine or whatever when you play video games. Like you're groping in the dark in research. So you don't know if you're on a promising track, if you're ever going to discover something useful, let alone something that could be profitable soon. But the business world, of course, like those guys, you know, they've got publicly traded stock. They've got pr profit goals that they have to meet this quarter or the board is going to force them out of their CEO position, bring in someone else that can get more profit into the company, get that stock price up. So because businesses are, broadly speaking, under a near term profit incentive, it's not really sensible to expect them to do like long run basic R&D where who knows if it'll ever make them a dime. You just can't expect it. Put yourself in the shoes of the business person or entrepreneur. You can't expect them to do this kind of research. You know, the competition won't be doing it, and they'll invest in ads and steal your customers away. 
So it ends up being the state that does the research. And that was certainly the case with the internet. But if you look into it, and I kind of didn't even realize the scope of this until I did you know, a couple of years of research for writing bit tyrants. Let me tell you, the rest of the technology in your, in your smartphone, the large majority of that stuff, the basic development of it came from you know, uh, the signals office oh, in the no. Pentagon. Uh-oh. Looks like we lost Mr. Larson for a little bit. Rob, are you there? Looks like your line dropped out. Rob. And when it comes to the actual smartphones themselves beyond the internet that they connect to, it's the same story. Now, people don't realize this, but most of the fancy components in your modern smartphones, you know, they're adapted to the commercial market by these big companies and the billionaires that own them. But the basic R&D, just like with the internet, was done through the public sector, you know. So start with something basic, right, like the GPS uh, in your phone that we all use for our maps applications and a million other things we do with our phones. That stuff was, you know, that's GPS. That everyone knows that's a Department of Defense technology. The antenna that lets your phone do all these connections. A lot of that technology comes from the Signals Office in the U.S. Army, where they're all about connecting. You know, you're communicating with the units in the field or that are deployed, right? So those are kind of obvious cases. Mm -hmm. The definitive thing about the modern smartphone, though, besides its connectivity online, is that multi-touch interface, they call it, right? The fancy touch-sensitive screen that you can put your fingers on, and it uses capacitive sensing. It actually runs on the ability of the human body to transmit tiny amounts of electricity. That's how it sort of senses what you're doing. And we all know with using our Samsung or Apple or whoever makes your phone, we know there's a ton of little gestures you can do to open and close applications and do different slick things with them. You know, Well, all of that technology comes from CERN. Okay, that's the uh, European Particle Collider. That's a couple of mile across facility where they collide subatomic particles so they can figure out you know what matter is made of on the tiniest scale. Well, that's a huge complicated. Famous from the Dan Brown books, right? <laughs> that's right. Its actual historical role uh, is uh, besides teaching us a lot about subatomic physics. Its big thing is that's where we develop things like not just HTML, which is how the internet works on its guts level, but also that's where a lot of the multi-touch interface work was done so that these uh, researchers could have a very easy to use, quick functioning a system that would let them manipulate this slick machine in a million different ways. Now, it took a long time for them to get that research done, and a ton of people, of course, contributed to this, like any big scientific project. That's usually the case. But the big thing is, those guys aren't under profit pressure. Rob, you know, are you there? In the Can you hear me? Yeah, man. Well, it looks like... Cut out again. All right, well, we had a few technical issues, but we are back. And what the one thing that I definitely want to get uh, across and get people to understand is that a lot of the information uh, or a lot of the, the, the I want to say the word propaganda out there about a lot of these guys that we look at as these great innovators, uh, Steve Jobs uh, with the iPhone, uh, Bill Gates with Microsoft, a lot of the technologies that go into these these devices they didn't create and you go into it a little bit in capitalism versus freedom and i believe you were saying earlier that you have a whole chapter uh, dedicated to that in bit tyrants so could you kind of expand on like the cell phone and how the cell phone or the touch screen technology that that uh steve jobs brags about how they created at Apple wasn't necessarily created at Apple. For sure, man. 
Yeah, uh, when Jobs debuted the iPhone back in 2007, he said it has this multi-touch interface which revolutionizes phones, and boy, have we patented it. And that's very accurate. They certainly patented it. What they didn't mention it is they bought up the patents that were relevant to it. Like they they patented it. It's more accurate to say they bought the patents is closer to the truth. So you take a look. Like that's what makes your fun kind of easy your phone uh fun and kind of easy to use, right? When you want to open up an mm-hmm. app or do anything with it. All these tiny little gestures you make with your fingers on the screen. And it'll do all the smooth shit that we can do with our phones now. And that's actually, you know, that touch screen sensitivity is actually based on something called uh, capacitive sensing, which is based on the ability of the human body to actually carry small amounts of electricity. But that technology is super slick and, you know, the world's been addicted to it ever since. Well, it's got to be said, most of that technology, again, was developed in the public sector. Like the biggest contribution to it comes from CERN, which is that European particle collider lab that's a couple mile across. And they use uh, giant magnets to smash protons together to learn about physics that way, which this giant, complicated ass facility. It's very hard to operate. So they had to have the ability to run it from different locations, like remotely. And so they developed this smooth, touch sensitive uh set of tools this interface that lets you uh operate that phone with your little fingertips you know well that's cern that's a publicly funded part you know research facility and if we look at other components of the phone gps everyone knows that originates in military technology um the antennas themselves off owe a lot of technology to the signals office of the army research and also even wi-fi comes from the university of hawaii so that the different uh research labs in the state could all share computer time with their main mainframe on uh, you know on a, their main island campus in Honolulu and they developed Wi-Fi radio technology to manage that so if you look at it everything in your phone that makes it fun from the internet connectivity to the GPS to the visual interface and many more aspects of it like the battery and all these other features they come from the public sector primarily and it kind of makes sense from an institutional sort of economic perspective, right? If you're in the Mm. business world, you've got near-term profit goals you have to meet. You've got a stock price that Wall Street investors buy and sell. And if your stock price falls, that's how CEOs get pushed out by their corporate boards and get replaced by someone else. So your incentive is to make money today, not to take a bunch of money and put it into some expensive research lab that maybe someday will come up with some new technology. That's the thing about research, you know, despite how it works in movies, like you're not usually trying to discover something you're you're in the dark. You're doing research. You're looking at something. You're trying to learn about something that's not discovered. You don't know what's there. So when you do real scientific research or technological research, you often don't know if the path that you're on is going to be a good one, or if it's going to like lead you to the technology you want, or if it's ever going to be useful. Let alone if it's ever going to make money. But in the military, in the universities, in these research settings, publicly, there you aren't under the gun of a stock Mm. price that you have to manage all the time. And so you can make those kind of commitments to long-term research. And bear in mind, it's not only slow-moving research, but it's expensive too. Scientists are expensive professionals, and they use all this custom equipment. It's expensive. So it just doesn't make sense to expect the corporate world to do that basic R&D. It's expensive, and who knows if you'll make money from it. Now, on the other hand, the government can do that. But the business world does do some research, but it's not the fundamental R&D. Like once the National Institutes of Health has discovered some promising compound, the pharmaceutical industry will take that and turn it into a drug that can go into your body, you know, and they'll take that military developed internet technology and make it into a slick ass sexy phone package, you know, like they're good at that level of research. But the big, pro- you know, the, the main thrust of research of finding this stuff in the first place, there's a long record on where this tech comes from. And it's the opposite of what everyone says on TV and what happens in, you know, Iron Man and other movies where the CEO does the research. (laughs) The reality is, you know, CEOs are senior managers. You know, they don't do the research and stuff like that. Some of these billionaires, at least in tech, like Sergey, uh, you know, Bryn and Larry Page at Google actually did do some of the core technical work to develop their mm-hmm. product. Bill Gates did some of that. Steve Jobs, not so much. Jeff Bezos, not, not so, so much. much. If you look at their records, you know, which is all, you know, on paper. And I look at it in Bit Tyrants, of course. But that's the like that's the thing there. At least the the 
technology is how everyone excuses the psychotic wealth and insane level of power that these bastards have. The reality is your parents' generation paid for that by paying taxes in the Cold War period. So people should uh, think about that next time. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny that you say the, the Iron Man analogy, because from my understanding, uh, wasn't Iron Man modeled after Steve Jobs? Mm. Or for oh, the yeah. movie, for the movie, not the comic book, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah, the comic book's a totally different story about an alcoholic who got traumatized in Vietnam. That's We'll put that aside. Uh, yeah, it's Steve Jobs really is like the modern archetypal CEO now. And certainly Iron Man's built on him, but so are like all these, whenever you see these movies where there's some slick turtleneck wearing CEO on stage and certainly become the basis for all of Silicon Valley too. That's all Jobs. And it's interesting, like Jobs is a classic case. Uh, if you look at him there, like Steve Wozniak, his you know business partner from when they were kids, developed most of the technical work that made like the Apple computers that first established the company and all the slick design of those iMacs was done by Johnny Ivey, this British designer, not Steve Jobs. If you look at the record, Jobs was mostly making decisions that hurt the company from refusing to put a fan into the Apple III, which made it overheat and shut down constantly. He was antagonistic to the iPod and then antagonistic toward turning the iPod into you know, porting it for Windows, which is when it really took off, when the mass of computer users could put their CDs on there. He resisted that. A bunch of aspects of the iPhone he was antagonistic toward. And this is all according to Apple's own employees in the you know uh, fortune 500 or fortune and wall street journal journalists who write the books about these companies they quote these executives and what you find out about steve jobs is he's a credit hogging bullying tyrant and a lot of these guys i didn't expect this when i started researching the field but gates jobs bezos are unusual even among ruling class corporate tyrants for being just unbelievable workplace bullies, screaming at employees, belittling them in front of others. And remember, the big thing is lots of people get in fights and are assholes, but these are guys yelling at their subordinates. So if you mm. talk back, you get fucking fired. That's a very different situation than if you and I get into an argument. You know, if I can fire you, yeah. well, now it's me bullying you and holding your livelihood over your head while I make you eat shit in front of all your friends at work. And there's a, you know, a ton of, there's a long record of this and mostly written again by pretty sympathetic business journalists who are sort of, oh, well, they're tyrants, but I guess that's just what it takes to run a big business like Apple and Amazon. <laughs> like they'll excuse these scumbags just like we excuse bullying bastards in the government. You know, powerful people get a pass all the time because people are kind of in love with power and money and all this, all these other aspects. But you take a look, Jobs, I mean, you know, it's, we give him credit and he's become, like we started saying, the CEO symbol of today. Yeah. But it's mostly a guy who took credit and was able to project this smooth image of, yes, we're all friends here and we create these amazing products. Turns out we really capitalize on public sector research that you paid for through taxes 20 years ago, and I get a bunch of smart people to do it for me while I yell at them and hurt their work. That's closer to the Steve Jobs biography. Because <laughs> that's not – wasn't there like two movies made about Steve Jobs? Man, I found out working on this book how many movies there are about these scumbags, and they keep coming out. There's that new Bill Gates documentary about what a great guy he is because of his foundation <laughs> – uh, which is itself a giant sham. We can circle back to that. But yeah, there's a couple books about yeah. Steve Jobs. I mean, the Walter Isaacson biography of him is over 800 pages. And I will admit publicly, I did not read that whole thing. I'm not going to read about this opportunistic scumbags like childhood flirts. My God. But I read <laughs> I read five full-length books about Apple and an infinite amount of reports and journalism and stuff. The book is well-researched, but even I have my limits. <laughs> you didn't want to read about Steve Jobs and his time at Atari? I learned so much just from reading about the company. I just didn't want to go further down the road of learning only about him. But I know a lot about his yeah. time at Atari, including how he he got hired to design that game for them when they were very young, obviously, Wozniak in the Atari days. Yeah, did yeah. Wozniak do it? Yeah, That's correct. Wozniak did it, and they were and then Jobs agreed that they would split the money. You'd think he would just give Woz the money since Wozniak did the development. Like he's the one who ended up doing the work. But then you this is all in the book too. And I have this, you know, from business journalists who weren't trying to condemn the company, like I kind of am. But they, he said that years later he gave Wozniak what it comes to a tiny fraction of the proportion of what they were paid. And so he stiffed Wozniak after Woz did all the work. And Wozniak says 
to this journalist who I put in the book. He says, like, when he found he, years later, somehow he found out what they were actually supposed to, you know, what Atari paid jobs for the work. <laughs> and he said he cried. Like Wozniak said he cried because he found out he was betrayed by his friend, like his friend for this petty bullshit. And Wozniak even says with job with Steve, when he has an idea, you don't know where it comes from. And some people interpret that as saying he's such a genius who knows where his ideas yeah. come from. If you look at the record of these two guys, and Wozniak is still alive, by the way, uh, and he talks about this stuff. Like my impression is what he meant by that was like, yeah, you never know whether he thought of it or whether he was ripping off some poor schmuck like myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised Jobs would take credit for the Us Festival in 83. <laughs> so, uh, when people are megalomaniacs, they will suck up credit for anything that walks into their field of vision. Now, speaking of megalomania and how I, I feel like these guys kind of wash their reputations of being megalomaniacs, especially uh, Bill Gates, hmm. um, with their philanthropic efforts. Uh, Microsoft was involved in a huge antitrust lawsuit in the 90s, was it? Oh, yeah, man. And that was, uh, I mean, there's so much that's interesting today that comes out of that story. Yeah. So in the US, we have relatively like weak and anti monopoly laws. Most countries, especially developed countries, have some version of competition laws. That's what they call them in the EU. Here in America, we call them antitrust laws because they were developed in the 1890s back before corporation was a thing that big businesses did. Back in those days, you formed a trust in, a, instead of a corporation. So, you know, Standard Oil, which was our American oil monopoly, was a trust. And when you buy up these competitors and add them to your monopoly, they're technically independent, but they're within this trust structure, which you control. So antitrust, it's our anti-monopoly law. But unlike the European Union, where like having a monopoly is only allowed like for patent or one or two other like kind of reasons or like for utilities and stuff. Uh, here in the US, it's not illegal to get a monopoly if you get it through like fair practice. So like Microsoft, <laughs> right? We mentioned, yeah, I know. So we mentioned earlier uh, Microsoft and how because of network effects, just the nature of computing operating systems, that market for things like Windows, you know, mm. uh, they naturally just because of the weird economics of that industry came to have a very strong monopoly uh, with a market share over 94% for a lot of uh, those years, which is Definitely monopoly territory. You don't have to have 100.0% to be a monopoly. You know, if you have 95% of the market and you disappear tomorrow, the market's destroyed. Like that shows the power that you got. So, but because you got it, because Microsoft got its Windows operating system monopoly through legit economics, that was not considered illegal. And Microsoft was not and has never been in legal trouble for having an operating system monopoly because they didn't do anything like sneaky, particularly to get it. It's because of the nature of capital capitalist markets for things that have networks, right? But what happens is what is illegal under our weak ass antitrust law is if you have a monopoly and then use it to take over another market to monopolize it. So monopoly, strictly speaking, is not illegal. Monopolization is illegal. This is American antitrust law. It's goofy. <laughs> So the big thing that they got in trouble for, I mean, Microsoft has a long history of using its monopoly in computing for decade after decade to crush competitors, to force them to sell their technology to them for pennies on the dollar. I mentioned this in the book. A couple of journalists who've covered Microsoft through the years describe the thing that Bill Gates used to do you know, in the 80s and 90s when Microsoft was complete king of the computing hill. Back then, he would slam his fist into his hand and say, we've got to crush Novell, or we've got to crush Lotus, or any company that was briefly challenging some segment of their computing monopoly. He would say, we've got to crush them. Conservative economists who certainly dominate my field, they'll tell you that, well, in markets, it's competitive and may the best man win. And some markets are competitive. Like we said before, there's a lot of variety in markets. If I'm here in Tacoma or you're in Oakland and you want to get a pack of cigarettes or gas up your car, you've got hundreds of places you can go to get a pack of camels or 10 gallons of unleaded. Right. But if I want to mm -hmm. you know, make an application and put it on a computer for people to see, and it's the 80s, 90s or 2000s, I've got to you know, do it for Windows. I've got to appease them. 
And so what happened was uh, in the mid 90s, the internet, after the military and the universities spent years developing it at our public expense, not through capitalism, once the internet started to become a mainstream consumer product, starting in the universities and then kind of growing out from there, uh, it was realized that web browsers could threaten with a Windows operating system because a lot of what you do with an operating system, you can do through a browser. And the big proof of that would be that today we have Chrome, the Chrome operating system and Chromebooks, which basically have nothing but a browser in them. And they operate like an operating system and they do everything through online connectivity. So Microsoft and Bill Gates were threatened by that. And so what they did was they basically copied the older version of Netscape, which was the independent web browser browser then. And they put that out through their Windows updates. So suddenly there's this shitty Microsoft browser that everyone's, everyone has on their computers because it comes with your Windows 95 up, update. If you're using mm -hmm. a computer, you suddenly have the shitty browser, which of course is Internet Explorer, which no one uses ex unless you're mm -hmm. at work and your PC boots or a browser. Home. And just today I saw yeah. they're renaming <laughs> their Internet Explorer to Edge or something cooler sounding like that, whatever. But the point is, because Microsoft had a, had a monopoly over operating systems, Netscape, the independent you know, web browser company, went from having 90 or 80 odd percent of the market down to a couple single digit percentages. They were completely crushed by Microsoft. One of their senior executives said, we're going to cut off their oxygen. So that is what the Federal Trade Commission and then later the Justice Department said, this is a, you know, a if violation of our antitrust laws. This violates the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. You're using your existing monopoly, which we accept, to take over this other adjacent industry, web browsing, which of course is a hugely important industry, as we all know. You know we're talking through browser-based technology right now. So that was what they went to court for. And that trial is fascinating. I do have a whole section about it in the Microsoft chapter of my book. I got a chapter in Big Tyrants on each of the big five uh, tech platform giants, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, because they're the five biggest companies in the world now, and they're all from tech. Very unusual for that to happen. And in that section on Microsoft's antitrust trial, it's a juicy trial. You know, If it wasn't completely overshadowed in the 90s by the OJ Simpson trial, it would be remembered as the big trial event of that decade. Because what happens in that story <laughs> is, first, I mean, Bill Gates gets subpoenaed, because you got to realize you know, in the European Union, if their anti, if their competition laws find that you're a monopolist, that's it. They start moving on to how they're going to punish you or break up your monopoly or maybe regulate you more or whatever. Here in the U.S., not only are there limited grounds for going after monopolies, but you also have to then convince a jury. Like they have to take you to court. And often the threat of the Justice Department uh, doing that is enough to make companies kind of ease up on some of their worst abuses of power. But not necessarily. Sometimes these things go to trial, like AT&T's uh, attempt to merge or his attempt to buy a bunch of Fox assets or T-Mobile and Sprint finally merging. Those went all the way to court and those companies won against the Justice Department in federal court. So the Gates, you know, the Microsoft case went to court and uh, Gates got... Uh, deposition through video, you know, like a lot of CEOs, he's too busy to come into court for the trial. So they go to, you know, the prosecutor goes to them and they tape it. You can watch, you know, it's hours of testimony. You can watch the highlights on YouTube. If you just search for that on that online monopoly, uh, you can see his uh, stuff. It's incredible. It's like, if you've seen that footage when Justin Bieber, for whatever the reason who gives a shit, he got in legal trouble probably for doing coke off the face of the sheriff in public or something. So he got uh, deposed in L.A. County, you know, with his attorney there. Mm -hmm. But if you watch him, it's ugly because this is a hot kid who gets blown every day by 10 people because he's a celebrity. And so he's not used to the idea of some prosecutor saying rude questions that imply he might have done something wrong. Bill Gates' deposition is exactly like that. He's incredibly invasive, unbelievably condescending. It's an ugly look. If people think Bill Gates is so great because now he gives tiny percentages of his fortune to help people who have malaria sometimes, take a look at what he did when he was still with the company and his height of his power. He's an evasive, condescending douchebag. But the reason why it ended up getting bad was because this thing went to trial. So soon, like, Microsoft has to give up its documents to the Justice Department, and there are endless uh, emails. You know, we have the actual emails. You know, it's not a conspiracy claim. We've got their internal documents through the court process. 
almost everything he said of material importance during his deposition turned out to be perjury. I don't know how he skated on that charge, but whatever. I couldn't find anything about that. Maybe he's too important. But all of his engineers and their emails just contradicted everything he said. They talked about how they're going to crush Netflix. If we bundle Explorer with our new uh, operating system updates, we'll totally take away all their market share because now everyone will have a competitor and it's integrated with Windows. So whenever you do anything that involves a browser, Explorer will automatically launch and all this sort of stuff. Endless sleazy scheming like that. Uh, eventually it came out, all that stuff came out in court. And so finally, unlike the other companies in my book, and unlike most companies today, Microsoft lost that court case and is formally adjudicated to be an, a monopolist of online operating system software, which is a unique shame distinction <laughs> that that company has. And what's amazing though, they appealed, of course, you can appeal court verdicts. And during their appeal, the 2000 election took place. And I don't know how old your viewers are. They may know that the 2000 presidential election is considered by most legal scholars to have been stolen. Basically, with the Supreme Court handing the White House to President George W. Bush, who then went on to invade Iraq and allow the destruction of New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina and the financial crash under his watch. Uh, history could have been very different if they had made a different decision. But when they came in, Bush, you know, Republican president, they tend to be more conservative, more pro-market, uh, broadly speaking, a lot of the, than the other deregulation. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. And they want less antitrust enforcement, lower taxes, of course, everyone knows that on corporations. And so his Justice Department announced that unlike Clinton's, they weren't going to seek a breakup of, of Microsoft. So even though it was found guilty, it wouldn't be broken up. They dropped that demand from their request for redress, the Justice Department, you know. Uh, and breaking a firm up, that's when you force a company to sell off pieces of itself. We used to do that back in the New Deal period, you know, the, from the 30s through the 80s, FDR and JFK. This is when we get the EPA and Social Security, you know, the welfare state that people like and so on. Bernie Sanders is basically a New Deal Democrat. Back then, antitrust enforcement was stronger than it is now. And you couldn't just get away with these flimsy defenses that Microsoft used. And so back then, we broke up Monopolis. We broke up Standard Oil. We broke up AT&T in 82, I believe. And that was the last Monopolist we ever broke up. And that's before most of y'all were alive, you know. And what happens is you force that company legally to sell off big chunks of its business. So AT&T had to break up its nationwide phone monopoly into to these regional monopolists. Microsoft was going to be broken up so that its operating system software would be one company and it's like office applications like Excel and Word, those would be a separate company. And they'd still be monopolies or semi-monopolies, but they'd be weaker for being separate companies at least. Because of Bush's stealing the election, that never happened. But they are still adjudicated to be a monopolist. But to me, the juiciest thing about this whole story, just to shut up about it, is that when Bill Gates was on trial, people don't remember this, but in the 90s, Gates was looking like shit on the TV every night because it's his smug bullshit in his video deposition. And then the news shows would just cut to what the court was finding in his, you know, his company's emails, which just directly contradicted everything he said. He was, and he, you know, this long record of stomping on companies, crushing them. He was on The Simpsons as a sleazy jerk one time who crushes people, you know, and that's the, you know, that's the real deal. So uh, in that era, that's when he created his foundation and made his big billion dollar contributions to it. It's in that era when he was looking like shit in the press that he decided it was worth putting, pouring money, you know, big money because he had billions and billions of dollars from his monopoly. He was able to put a lot of money into that foundation. And I've written about that foundation for Jacoban, for Jacoban and other places. Folks can take a look at it online if they want. But it does perfectly good work for people. That's right. But he do, it does perfectly good work for people, you know, in the developing world, fighting malaria and helping people get access to water. That's great. But the question is, should Bill Gates be in charge of how that process works? And the fact is, the history of it is he used that foundation to launder his reputation. And now Bill Gates is seen as this great, you know, grandfatherly philanthropist who helps the poor. He's in that position because he was a aggressive, bloodthirsty monopolist throughout the 1990s. And that's the story of Microsoft. And if you enjoy that, that's not the sleaziest story in the book. So people might want to consider uh, taking a look at it. That's just a taste. Just a taste. Now, to Bill Gates' uh, reputation laundering with his philanthropic efforts, He's kind of also destroyed some things too. Uh, education, 
Oh yeah. Public school education. Absolutely. Yeah, out of his way to screw up with standardized testing, right? Absolutely. That's completely true. Uh, billionaires historically, um, you know, some of them feel like giving away money for philanthropy. Some don't. So people like Rockefeller or Jeff Bezos gave famously small amounts. Others like Carnegie or Gates do give a lot. And I would just say it's just another manifestation of their power. You know, they have power over the markets they monopolize. They have power over the subordinates that they scream at. It's another form of their power if they can decide whether, you know, Carnegie decides whether your town gets a library or Gates decides whether your third world country gets a fresh water pump. Like they shouldn't be in that position to make that distinction, that decision. Like the people in some form should be democratically making those big choices about what to do with our resources and how to develop ourselves. But it's another way they have power. And now people will talk about how wonderful they are because they gave half of a percent of their wealth, which they'll never miss, so that a bunch of people can have some resource that they decided to let them have. And it's a, it's a pretty gross story. But education has always been a special one. Like Carnegie was fascinated with this. Uh, J.P. Morgan himself uh, was as well. And now with Gates and some other figures too. Yeah, they love the modern version of this is charter schools. Charter schools, you know, I mean, our public schools have a lot of problems. Perhaps one thing is that their funding hasn't grown in real terms in 20 years. And we're always eager to cut their funding so that that will make them more efficient somehow. This is what we call austerity in public budgeting. We've been doing this to schools and for public health for years. That's one reason why we have this pandemic right now. Mike Davis uh, writing in... Um, Oh, where was that? Not in Labor Notes. I forget where he wrote this. Um, you folks can find it. He made the simple point that uh, we have 60,000 fewer public health workers in America than we did in 2008 when the last uh, recession happened and we cut our public budgets back. Those jobs never came back. And now we're on our ass in this pandemic and we had to shut down the economy just to stall it. It's a big mess when we do this sort of stuff. But what we do with charter schools is we make the schools shittier by cutting their funding over years. And then we say, hey, why don't we cut off some of this nicer facilities the schools have, make those privately run by some scumbags. Usually it's some philanthropists like the Gates Foundation. And that means they're getting tax money for their funding. We still pay for these schools. But now the curriculum is controlled by some rich remote bastard somewhere. And you're gonna. what it does is it turns education from a process of helping young people figure out what they're gift is and how they can contribute to the world, it turns education into fucking glorified job training. And training for the workforce is important, but it's not all there is in education. Like you need to learn about the world so you can be a citizen and just avoid like hurting yourself in life. You know, it's not just enough that we get train you how to do your job and kick you out. Like this is your, the only time you're going to be exposed to things like science and the arts and history. So you have an idea about what happens when you vote for people, <laughs> you know, charter schools, there's less and less of that and more and more job training. And they also try to cater toward wealthier, more affluent people. So they get the kids of wealthy parents because they can afford to pay the charter school more. It's definitely not a solution to our problems, but people like Bill Gates and lots of other big billionaires like Warren Buffett love charter schools because they're a way for them to gain more control over the education that young people receive and make them less likely to chop all their heads off in guillotines for ruining our lives someday. And it also doesn't crush teachers' unions because a lot of those schools are Oh, of unions. course. That's like the ticking of the clock is trying to crush the teachers' unions. And you know, let me tell you, I'm with AFT. I'm an AFT member myself, you know, local 2196. And uh, yeah. it's important. It's important for us to have like some ability to shape what it has done on our campus and not just have everything be the bosses or the administrations, as we say, uh, their decision. I would say that there's some real value to that. You know, people don't want to just be at the mercy of their boss. Like having a union gives you at least some countervailing authority to push back when they try to make you work with no protections during COVID-19. If you have a union, you can fight back on that stuff. If you don't and they push you back to work, I mean, you can walk off the job, but now you're out of a job during this depression that we're in. It's, it's, it's dangerous. But of course, they hate those teacher unions. That's the first thing they do. And some of my colleagues are trying to organize, uh, you know, uh, locals and union, uh, you know, teachers unions in those charter schools. It's easier said than done, man. Uh, there's a lot of it's an uphill battle forming a union. But I can tell you when if you can establish one, there are real, real benefits to that just from, you know, your benefits, you know, your health insurance covering more things to having some ability to push back uh, in the workplace. So, yeah, of course, billionaires like Bill Gates don't think much of that. <laughs> And before we go, uh, and again, I haven't gotten a chance to finish Bit Tyrants because I got it today, but I, I cracked it open this <laughs> morning. And again, much like uh, capitalism and freedom for me, 
uh, and I'm going to say this, everybody, the writing style of Professor Larson, it's, it's easy to read. It's fun. Um, there's two economists I love reading, and it's you and uh, Richard Wolf. Oh, sure. Rick Wolf. Yeah, he's great. I'm a big fan of him, too. Well, yes. thanks. That's that's great to be compared to, man. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I work at the community college level, so I just try to write at a level where my students could, you know, follow along. So it just means being playful and trying to be fun. And it's true in economics, we don't have a big tendency of writing in a fun manner. Uh, no. <laughs> I sometimes say to people sometimes, like, one of my goals in life is to be the world's funniest economist. I feel very – I feel good about that. Like, they say you should set goals that are achievable. And I really feel like that is an achievable goal. That is definitely something that you can do. You're up there because there's only a few economists that I actually like dig listening to. Michael Hudson. Oh, sure. Mike uh, Hudson uh, of, of UMKC. That's where I got my master's actually. Oh, no shit. I love Kansas City. Great barbecue. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Great, great department there. If any of your listeners are considering a career in economics, U of Missouri, Kansas City campus. Check that out. <laughs> uh, but, you know... They're, they're, those guys are definitely economists. You know, Richard Wolf is just a little angrier. But, <laughs> He's bombastic, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to, like I said, easy to read, fun, hard to put down, a Rob Larson book is the way to go. And also the uh, articles you write for Jacobin and Current Affairs, equally as fun. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, especially at affairs, we try to write in a fun way, make it very readable. Uh, so, yeah, you're not suffering through this stuff. Like, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of depressing things happening in the world right now, and some exciting things, obviously, lately too. But uh, when you get to the economic stuff, you need it to be kind of fun to get you through the drabber material, you know. Uh, so, thanks, man. I do my I do my best on that. And yeah, uh, Current Affairs is a great place to see the writing I've got going on, uh, you know, in the moment. But uh, yeah, the books, I think people will find that they're a lot easier and more enjoyable to read than the stuff you think of uh, when you hear, you know, the word <laughs> economics. Like that's a, that's a cliche we have in econ, right? You know, people call it the dismal science economics because we deal with, you know, spreadsheets and supply and demand and econometrics. It's kind of drab. So people find out I'm an economist and they go, ah, the dismal science. And I go, eh, you're half right. It's not really a science. It's just kind of a dismal <laughs> area of research. So making it fun at all, I feel like is a calling card of mine. So I really appreciate you saying that, man. Uh, thank you. That means a lot. No, you're doing the damn thing. Uh, now you have a chapter about Facebook called disgrace book. <laughs> Um, I want to say this much about Facebook. I had did an interview with uh, activists and she's running for president Gloria Lariva. Okay. Um, with, uh, with Leonard Peltier. That's her running mate. Oh, okay. Um, for the, the, was it peace and liberation uh, party? Sure. No party for socialism and liberation. I'm sorry. Oh, I remember that. Um, and, Facebook won't let me promote the post. Interesting. Uh, yeah, like that's really interesting stuff now. And with Twitter, after all these years, starting to put uh, notices on the president's tweets when he promotes violence or makes full on false claims about like chloroquine and bleach and stuff, Facebook's declined to do yeah. that. Like they'll let him say whatever he wants. But then, yeah, like people yeah. who are posting about like Israel sometimes yeah, or with, you know, uh, small political parties like that, they'll find that they can't post or they can't share or they can't promote the post. And the thing about it is like, there's no transparency. No one has any idea why these things happen. Twitter bans people for baffling reasons. Let other people carry on. It's because these companies were focused on exploiting their network effect and building out their giant multi-billion dollar platforms. And years later, when things were out of control, they realized, oh, we've really never done anything to police these platforms or make them under control. So you get this totally patchwork approach like that. And it's fascinating too, because essentially these companies, you can make a good argument, they should be considered like public utilities, like things that yes. everyone relies on, because they're like the public square now. If you've got something to say and you can't put it on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you're kind of excluded from the public discourse to a significant degree, because that's how people you know, 
find out what their friends are thinking or where they go to find interesting you know, news items or stories or things like that. And these companies, though, are completely private and they're motivated to increase their share price for this quarter. Like that's their goal, not facilitating public debate in some healthy manner. And it's not clear exactly what these companies should do in every instance, you know. Should you kick off this person or keep that person on? Often there are difficult choices because we all support free speech, but no one wants things like incitement to violence. Like that's been a traditional red line for media in general. And you know, you could also apply it to these tech platforms. Like if I go out and I say Donald Trump sucks, he should be thrown out of office, like that's fine. But if I go on TV and say Donald Trump should be shot with a rifle, well, that's incitement to violence, right? You're trying to get people to do something violent. Historically, mm-hmm. that's been a line that you're not allowed to cross in media. Like the FCC can come after you if you do that. And so gradually the platforms have sort of been groping toward that. Like Alex Jones is a classic case, you know, Alex Jones, like the frothing at the mouth far right crazy conspiracy monger total turn of the frogs gay oh it's turn of the frogs gay that's uh, he knows he knows our real problems (laughs) god it's a freaking mess but that guy like on on his program like you know like video program like he would talk about like a stupid robert mueller who idiots thought were going to make donald trump go away based on nothing uh Mm -hmm. like he would talk about him and he would pantomime like holding a rifle and say someone's got to do something about him. And he would pantomime like shooting a rifle. <laughs> like, get it? Kill this guy, someone. Eventually, yeah. Facebook and Twitter threw him off their platforms. Saying, okay, you're inciting, you're, you're inciting violence now. It doesn't matter how much people love your viewpoint. If you're going to be out here saying kill people, you're not allowed on the platform. Like, that's an old principle old media used. And again, it's debatable whether that's right. But at least that, that's a standard that can be turned to. Twitter's starting to do that with the president. Facebook was refusing to. And they've said, like, we have their documents where they say one reason why they don't want to do that is it would, if like, kicking hate speech off Twitter would mean kick, kicking off a lot of Republican office holders and media figures who push this shit in more acceptable words all the time. But the point is, if these companies are so important, that being thrown off them kind of kicks you out of the public square. It means they're too important to just be a corporation that only cares about its rich investors who own it. Like it should have real, at least controls on its behavior. Maybe like the Warren and Sanders campaigns were saying they should be seen as public utilities and be run publicly, or at least have like very serious lines around when they're allowed to, yeah, keep you from promoting or upvoting or sharing a post or something like that. But it shows how much these companies are in control and how much their monopolies matter. If you can't get on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, I mean, you're out of the public discourse to a significant extent. We still hear from Alex Jones, of course, because he has his own media entities, but it is a huge blow to him. And they fought really hard on that. And conservative groups are now fighting in court saying that Facebook shouldn't be allowed to throw their right wing uh, pages off or like a Prager U, that super far right YouTube channel, which is a pile of crap on current affairs, YouTube channel. A lot of what we do is just trying to counter program Prager U. People should check out that video <laughs> channel if you want to see it. Uh, but there, like they got kicked off of, um, I, I, you know what, that's not, they, they lost uh, some of their YouTube privileges and ability to promote their posts. And they took Facebook Monetized. to court. They took YouTube to court and said, this is the public square. How dare yeah. you kick us off? That's not fair. But it's hilarious. That's the opposite of their political view. Their whole their whole conservative thing is it's private property. The big government shouldn't be able to tell me what to do. As soon as, as, soon as YouTube made a decision that hurt them, it's no, you should be regulated. You should be, the state should keep you from throwing me off the platform. As soon as they're inconvenienced by their ideals, they throw them in the garbage. <laughs> Isn't that the same thing Donald Trump did when the Twitter tried to not even ban him, just put the fact check thing on what he said? Yeah, on just the specific tweets, too. Like, it's not a blanket thing. Like, he's still tweeting his brains out. But his most egregious, like, you know, tweets about the disease and how to fight it and so on. Yeah, they put some little tags on his tweet saying, this is, you know, contentious. Yeah, Trump immediately lost his mind and said, like, we're going to make have the government force you to put my tweets up. Like, these guys are all about small government. Let the market decide. Let private efficient businesses decide now some of them are making decisions to kick their hate speech off their platform and that de- that decision's completely in the trash it's kind of amazing to see how fast they'll do an about face on that stuff i had adriel hampton on a couple of weeks ago i don't know if you know him he is the the person that uh made the fake ad where he took uh, lindsey graham and edited it to make it like look like lindsey graham was pro the green new deal ha! that must and- have been some real editing <laughs> he said he took him all day and 
and he ran it on Facebook because Facebook was saying this is right after the AOC had the congressional hearing with Mark Zuckerberg oh. and, and she was calling him out on. Well, so I can just say I can target a group of black people in a certain zip code and tell them voting day is Wednesday. And Zuckerberg was like, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this pretty- guy made an ad about that. He found out he had to like run for office for it to be OK. So it was only if you ran. For ah, see, that, that is a big loophole that Zuckerberg put up. So like if you're a public figure. We are yeah. going to subject you to the same controls. Well, great. So I'll just say I'm a public figure and now I can make up a bunch of lies. And Elizabeth Warren was putting up posts saying like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, met Donald Trump or something, or something like that. Yeah, I yeah. forget the details. But yeah, like several people had been trolling Facebook pretty hard and pretty deservedly, I would say. They've got it coming. It's it's just insane that the, and that platform is so huge. Oh, and yeah. uh, I've, I've actually been privy to be in, in certain rooms uh, with those people and they want to be where you get your news indeed (laughs) they say they say we are the place where you will get your news but we don't produce the news you know the wall street journal and new york times will produce the news they just won't get any of the ad revenue that used to sustain their business yeah, uh, yeah. It's a the mo- it's but again, it's because these are private companies. They don't care about what that does to the news ecosystem or what that'll do to their ability to fund journalism after losing their profit models because now that it can't sell ads because Facebook and Google take them all, they just care about meeting their profit goal for this quarter and not disappointing their investors and making sure the analysts are happy so that their stock price will go up and their share linked compensation will increase. It's just like this mercenary entity that doesn't care about anything but its own profit, but the influence. They have over our national debate now is, I mean, it's so big. Yeah, we've got these politicians trolling Zuckerberg on purpose to show him how bad his rules are. If you can make Lindsey Graham sound like he's pro the Green New Deal, something's got to be done because that is a hilarious uh, inversion of reality. That's uh, yeah, that speaks to, to the issue, man. That must be interesting, though. Yeah, like the insider aspect of it is interesting. I'm completely on the outside, obviously. I'm just a small time academic who used the Wall Street Journal and books about these companies to compile their history. But what hap- I assume what happens in the private rooms and private meetings is much grosser. And that sounds like what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you're when you want to control the news narrative, but you don't want to take any responsibility for the narrative that you're controlling. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's problematic. <laughs> you said it. Now, the 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 last chapter, I don't want to give too much away about the book is share this. Now, this is a very leftist show. Uh, I, if I have to have a political affiliation, I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed socialist. Um, when you say share this when it comes to the internet, um, are you talking about breaking up the big tech companies? Uh, you know, I think breaking up some of these giants is a totally reasonable near-term move. Um, you know, some, sometimes it's not necessarily clear Um, how much the conditions would be helped by breaking them up because part of their value and the reason they work well comes from the fact that they are monopolies and they connect lots of people. Like if Google is broken up into a couple pieces, like its search quality would suffer because it uses all its data to customize Mm -hmm. search results and to build up its general search algorithm. So it's not always clear that breaking these companies up would be the answer. And sometimes I think, you know, my left-wing colleagues struggle with this, but the fact is like modern the modern economy requires big entities. If we didn't produce gasoline in a couple giant refineries, if we didn't make our products in giant assembly complexes, we wouldn't have the economies of scale that makes them affordable just on the most basic level for people to purchase. You know, So big enterprises sometimes are required. I don't always think we should break these firms up. So what I talk about in the last chapter of Bit Tyrants, yeah, is uh, an online socialism. And what I suggest there is that we do the classic socialist goal. You know, socialism's like, you know, liberalism or any other political term, it gets stretched and debased and turned into 30 different things. Traditionally, like the most key socialist thing was worker control of the means of production, right? You go into Mm -hmm. your workplace, instead of your boss knowing what's going on and telling you what to do, you and your coworkers have access to that information and you decide together through some kind of democratic process or another 
what you're going to do and you work with other industries that you know use your product or that supply you with materials and use free association and some kind of federalism to organize the economy along those grounds. So instead of having Jeff Bezos screaming at you, you and your coworkers decide what's going to happen and you send your representatives to other businesses uh, so you can articulate and keep functioning you know, pro, you know, chains of production happening, but ones that we humans control instead of these corporations and their near-term capitalist profit incentives. Well, that's the idea of socialism. I think it makes a lot of sense for the broader economy, and I think it makes sense for the tech economy too. And so in that last chapter, I take a look at what that would mean to bring these platforms under the control of their workers, like the engineers who design all that fancy software code. And also, mm -hmm. you know, like the basic telecom workers who run those server centers so that our YouTube, you know, uh, latency times are low. And also like the thousands of of low paid contract hired often temp content moderators who work on like these big monopoly platforms especially facebook and youtube who were hired lately because of the hideous stuff that ends up on those platforms and those guys have the worst job in jobs in tech you know they get paid small temp worker salaries to spend their work day looking at the most twisted fucked up shit that humans do and it's child oh. soldiers and sexual assaults and murders oh. and war crimes happening all that stuff gets streamed on facebook and put up on youtube and so the content moderators your job for some shitty 13 bucks an hour is going to be seeing one of those looking at it for a couple seconds, making a call, whether it can go on the platform or whether it should be not promotable, or whether it should be kept off the platform or what, and you designate it. And then the next one starts and then the next one. And now you've worked in this job for six months and you've lost touch with reality because you've seen more fucked up shit than like 20 human beings should see in their whole lifetime in the course of a week and a half. <laughs> and there's notoriously high turnover in these, in this industry, believe it or not because of that stuff. Those poor bastards should have a role in what happens on the platforms. Like they're suffering to clean up these platforms so that we can use them without seeing heinous shit all the time. Like they should have a role in this process too. And the big thing I say to finish this up in chapter 10 is that you need to realize if we're going to put an industry under the control of its workers, that traditional socialist ideal of different types, uh, that partially means us. Because as a lot of people have realized, like these companies, platforms, like they're free to use. It's free to make a Facebook account. It's free to put video on YouTube. There's no charge to sell your upfront charge to sell your products on Amazon's marketplace, you know. But it's our work that creates all that content that makes those platforms attractive. If we didn't make the websites, Google wouldn't have uh, so many people using its uh, mobile search monopoly you know, for its, for its search engine to index. And if we weren't creating all these posts on Facebook and Twitter, those companies wouldn't have attractive content to bring people in. We posters and content makers are part of the workforce for these platforms. That's just part of where the value of these trillion dollar platforms comes from. And so we need to realize if we want to socialize these firms and bring them under public control so they don't fuck up our political system any more than they already have, and again, these are the biggest companies in the world now. It would mean us working, us users trying to organize ourselves and work together with the workers in these companies who are starting to organize. Like there are some early stirrings of that process. We have walkouts happening at Google, Amazon, and even Facebook just last week. Unheard of. When this shows like these workers are getting fed up with the dark shit that their companies do, with their incompetent treating of the elections, and with putting them back to work in the face of diseases, you know, in the case of Amazon, its warehouse empire. So this is starting to be a thing that people are talking about. We're going through a wave of national political activism right now in the face of, I mean, we're three crises deep right now, four if you count Trump, five if you count climate. So people are like waking up and wanting to do uh, some real activism. People should think about organizing, not just through posting, you know, you know, not, not just shit posting on Twitter, but organizing with your friends and coworkers. So we have some actual power in the workplace and nationally, and certainly organizing those tap tech platforms would play a major role in that process. So that's what I sort of look at with that uh, chapter on online socialism. Well, uh, outside of your book, Bit Tyrant, is there anything else you would like to promote? Uh, yeah, please check out the book. 
I'm very proud of it. It just got picked to be uh, the Left Book Club selection for June uh, over in the UK. It's a really fun, very readable book. And of course, yeah, I do recommend my last book also, Capitalism Versus Freedom, The Toll Road to Serfdom. That's the book if you were thinking about socialism and capitalism and trying to figure out your own views about the world, that might be a strong thing to read. And I wrote that to be uh, as playful as possible. Uh, also, I'm doing a lot of video uh, for Current Affairs, and it's online uh, YouTube channel, which we mentioned before. Uh, just had a video go up there about uh, capitalism and freedom and some of these issues. Also talked about uh, tech a lot there, and there's a lot of other really fun video content there. Uh, so folks should uh, check that out when they're sitting around uh, bored looking at YouTube. And uh, yeah, I would say that would be uh, the best stuff people could look at right now. Well, I'm definitely going to have a link to uh, Bit Tyrants, the Haymarket link. And Great man. Zero books did uh, zero books to the uh, capitalism versus freedom, right? Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, I'm going to play some music and don't hang up. My pleasure, man. Uh-huh.